Why did you join the Communist Party? What were the cultural imperatives that pushed you towards it? Ah, the cultural imperatives I wasn't aware of at the time was that here we came over with Jews, uh, lost our East European Jewish culture and belonging. We didn't belong anywhere, so we were uh, active as it were, with a large God-shaped blank, to use Huckley's term. So we looked for a new religion, a new identity. Hence, you became a communist, which you learned that the international unites the human race, so you mixed up with other Jews I in the search of this identity, or as the Bible would say, wh whoring after strange gods. You didn't live in the main part of the Jewish East End, in the Stepney, Mile End area. You were a little bit further to the northeast, I suppose it would be. Yes. Now, was Hackney uh, a mainly, was the Hackney Communist Party mainly Jewish, or was it a mixture of it was mainly Jewish. The Jews formed a, a disproportionately large number in relation uh, to their population. So, in, in a sense, uh, we lived in a semi-ghetto, and the Communist Party was an intellectual, emotional ghetto of its own. But obviously, there, there was reason things were falling to pieces: the rise of Hitler, uh, uh, unemployment, the world, which for us means Europe, had not recovered from the First World War. But this, there's something quite remarkable about this, isn't there? That the East End of London was by far the biggest uh, Jewish area in Britain. And it seems that for a, a time in the 30s, perhaps the dominant force in terms of activity and numbers among the Jews of the East End was the Communist Party, which has never been of any significance in this country. It, it is quite a remarkable phenomenon. I just wonder whether to an extent you were picking up on an earlier tradition, a Bundist tradition or the libertarian tradition which Rudolf Rocker epitomised in the East End just before the First World War, whether there was a, a follow-through of that. Well, there's a lot of historical work to be done, but in addition to the East End, the Communist Party controlled the Clyde side, Red Clyde, uh, South Wales, uh, Merseyside, Irish areas, it was, as it were, the party of the outs. Uh, also, the Communist Party always appears to be stronger than it is, because it's running this, that, and the other, and demonstrations. Whenever there was a test of strength between them and the Labour leadership, the la Labour leadership won, they destroyed the Communist hold in various organisations, then the Communists got to work and built them up again. The Communists never slept. But you didn't just join the party, after all, as you say, uh, several thousand young Jews joined the, the Communist Party in the East End in the 30s. You actually went to fight in Spain, and very few British Jewish communists did that. What pushed you towards taking that further step? Well, it was a tradition of Byron. It was the English part of my background, the tradition of Englishmen going to fight for valiant causes. It's been said of you, I don't know whether it's uh, fairly or not, that you're the only right-winger who has at one time literally machine-gunned other right-wingers. It's probably not true. Uh, certainly when I was in Venezuela in 1962, and there a social democratic regime was in power after the um, right-wing or gangster dictator Perez Jiménez was overthrown, and they suffered uprising, first of all from the Castrite wing communist socialists and then supported by the Moscow socialists. And they had to fight them down. And one of the main advisers to the president was a Cuban who'd fought in Spain in the international brigades, who was socialist, anti-communist. I think you'll find that the people from the international brigade split. Many of them uh, were not communists. And many of them took part in certainly in Latin America, fighting off the communist insurgents who were trying to destroy uh, democratic regimes, particularly uh, those with an element of socialism, on the grounds that if they destabilized them and had them replaced by military dictatorship, that would be grist to their mill. Your membership of the Communist Party wasn't a brief affair. It wasn't just a, a youthful fling. You remained a member, I think, for more than ten years. I uh, well, not more than ten years, about ten years. It was beginning to fray at the edges after about eight. But this is through various changes of line, and through the most dramatic change of line of all, which is the uh, People's War to Imperialist War change of line in, in the autumn of 1939. How did you manage to, to adapt with that perpetually changing party line? 
I, I'd been called up into the army, and so really the, the whole thing was in mothballs till I got out of the army. And by the time I got out of the army, the uh, communist, and I went to the LSE a communist and came out uh, uh, not a communist. So the, the war period was a moratorium. I was in the Middle East and uh, learning Arabic and uh, Marxism doesn't tell you very much about the Middle East. It's an irrelevancy. So it wasn't um, f f nine years full time. As it were. You had this great gap in between. You've explained why so many young Jews joined the Communist Party. We're talking about events now what, more than well over 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you feel any sense of pride or of regret for, for what you did, your activity as a communist, all that time ago? Uh, very difficult to say. There's no point. You look at its history. Sherman, 50 years ago, really is a different person. Uh, there were certain historical developments then, and we went along with the current, uh, no doubt. I mean, if, if I knew then, known then what I know today, it would be different. But that can be said to be true of everybody. I don't really see any point in regret or non-regret. When you left the Communist Party in, I think, 1948, was that in any way because of your Jewish identity, because of concern about uh, Israel, because of uh, concern about the Labour Party's policy towards the Middle East, or was it over other issues? Well, I, I fear the answer will be yes or no, and no. I had started to become aware of my Jewish identity, I think, in '47. Uh, and this was getting stronger, and I think it was one of the underground factors which made me readier to leave. The actual bone of contention was that I'd been due to give a lecture on Yugoslavia, which I, I knew a bit, and I could speak sober pride, so on and so forth, and I was told in the course of a day to reverse what I was going to say diametrically, and of course that was too much to swallow, so that was the end. But most communists who leave, and after all, uh, we had a huge turnover from the Communist Party, something happens, one little thing, but in fact, it only happens because there'd been a build-up of resentments and misgivings and second thoughts over a period. I was looking back at a short story I wrote about a biblical theme, while I was still a communist, and anybody reading that would say this is a, a veiled satire against communists. I wasn't aware of that fact. How aware were you, though, when you were in the party about the status and the fate of the Jewish minority in the Soviet Union? Well, not at all. Uh, in fact, it was only afterwards I became aware of that, because all the propaganda, including the propaganda by the Anglo-Jewish establishment, uh, suggested that things in the Soviet Union were quite good, and that the anti-Semitism was something done by somebody else. It was only afterwards... Uh, when one's eyes were opened, one began to learn about the problem of Jews in the Soviet Union. You ask about, you mention anti-Semitism. Was there any anti-Semitism in the Communist Party? I ask that because it might seem a strange question. As you say, Jews were a very large component of the Communist Party. Very, very few made it to very senior ranks. Uh, because they weren't real proletarians, you see. They were neither proletarians nor intellectuals. So they were the labourers in the vineyard. When one wasn't aware of it, uh, I suppose you shut it out. And I was in Yugoslavia, and there there wasn't anti-Semitism in the communist ranks. Uh, later, I heard that from 1938 onwards, when the Russians were getting ready for the pact, they began to weed out the Jews from the Tailman Brigade, and you did have anti-Semitism, but one only learned about that later. And, and when you left the Communist Party, did you still regard yourself as a socialist? And how, how gradual was your peregrination from, from extreme left to, uh, uh, shall we say, firm right? Well, I'm not sure what right wing means, except being against the left. But what happened was that I went into journalism. I was writing for The Observer, and I was invited to become foreign editor of the Jerusalem Post. I, Israel. I didn't know it was owned by the Israeli Labour Party. I went out there and found that it was a party paper and a party line. Uh, I remember the day that Farouk was sent out by 
uh, NASA revolution, I wrote a leader with three points. One, that uh, Naguib would not stay in power, would be replaced by other people. Secondly, it would not be a democracy, but a military dictatorship. Thirdly, the new regime would be much more dangerous to Israel than Fat Farouk was. And uh, the commissar used to call a politruk, it's from the uh, politruk, is a Russian acronym for the political commissar, took it to the party and they turned it down. They said, we have to hope. I thought that was pretty stupid. But then I worked as an economic advisor. And since it was socialist government, I was trying to make socialism work. And I found you couldn't make it work. The vested interests there were so strong that instead of a planned economy, you had all these satrapies and fiefdoms fighting each other. It was in Israel that I really learned that socialism doesn't work. And you've got to work with the market. But that does not mean that... We, first of all, capitalism is a, a Marxist term. We're not living really under capitalism, we're living in the Vale of Tears, and uh, we haven't solved most of the problems of human society. The only thing is socialism doesn't work, and socialism is a red herring, a blind alley, and worse still, in arguing against socialism, people praise the market, they almost deify the market economy to absurd lengths so that they become obverse of socialists. We have to move the scales of socialism from our eyes and see the reality of the late 20th century and think how mankind can move forward. I think the tw 21st century is going to be worse for most inhabitants of the globe in the 20th. Looking at the composition of the House of Commons in those uh, post-war years. In 45, there were, I think, 26 Jewish Labour MPs elected, and, of course, there was Phil Piratin for, for Mile End. Mm -hmm. There was only one Jewish Conservative, and he didn't take the party whip. Um, I've forgotten the name, but there was one independent Conservative. Now things are quite different. We've got twice as many Jewish Conservative MPs as Jewish Labour MPs. What is the cause of that? Is it assimilation, integration, increasing wealth, or is it uh, the importance of Israel in, in determining the votes of British Jews? Oh, there's a whole mixture. For a start, it's cyclical. There were Jewish MPs in the last century and in the period leading up to the Second World War, then uh, down, uh, because most Jews were not the sort of person who would be a Conservative MP. Uh, then, for a start, obviously... The Jewish Before you go on, when you say that, are you talking in class terms, or are you saying that conservative activists would not want Jews to represent them? No, I mean the Jew who was getting on. The conservatives then chose a special kind of person, and he, he would either be a QC, be a person with some inherited wealth, army type. The Jew who was getting on was not the type of person who would be a Conservative member, or for that matter wanted to be a, a, a member of Parliament. And because you had a tradition in the Conservative Party of anti-Catholicism, which expressed itself in uh, limiting their membership and support to the Church of England, and this really incidentally reflected back on the Jews, because they weren't Church of England, so large numbers of the sort of Jew who might have been a Tory MP became Liberal MPs. And then when the Liberal Party fell to pieces, those Jews who wanted to be MPs had to choose between Labour or Conservative. So many of them looked to the Conservatives. But at the same time, there was a change in the social composition. In the 1880s, there were 50,000 Jews in this country. A fair amount of assimilation but mainly quite religious. And they got on in stock market professions, so on. Uh, during, after the big pogroms, first in Kishinev and then in Odessa, uh, you had about 100,000 Jews came over 25 years. And they were Jews from backward area, very lively, they spoke Yiddish, they were poor. Uh, they came mainly from the Baltic because uh, uh, not simply the Baltic states, Lithuania, 
Grand, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Poland, because you could travel very cheaply on the timber boats, whereas uh, if you want to travel on steamer, however, poor, uh, you paid more, and so they finished up in the Pool of London. And now, uh, over the period, uh, they were poor, they grow a high birth rate. By the Second World War, and its aftermath, they'd become, or the children and grandchildren settled in professions, business. They didn't regard themselves as underdogs anymore. So, and the underdog was the Irish or English poor white that they, they or their fathers or grandfathers had been brought up among, and they were still down there while the Jews were up here. So it was a different community, and uh, that changed. Then, a little later, disillusioned with the Soviet treatment of uh, Jews and uh, the state of Israel and continuing upward mobility and the Jews linkage with socialism was a temporary thing because those Jews who are not really middle class a Jew would rather be a small businessman run his own shop his own taxi uh, he's by nature a petit bourgeois if he can't get any further but he's ambitious his son uh, he hopes will be a doctor or a lawyer my son-in-law, the doctor, is drowning. And th therefore you had this social change, together with religious change, the Conservative Party allowed Catholics and therefore Jews. Uh, all, all these changes uh, work together to produce a situation now where I think you probably have more Jewish Conservative MPs than Labour MPs, though neither the Labour Party nor the Conservative Party are what they were. Having said all that, how important was uh, the shelling of the cockle shell boats, Bevin's action against uh, Jews going back to Palestine? How important was Labour's stand on Suez in, in turning British Jews away from the Labour Party? I, I don't know, because uh, I never lived very much among Jews before I went to Israel. Uh, when I came back for a while, I wrote for the Jewish Chronicle, getting closer to Jews. Most of my life is not lived... Uh, among Jews, uh, more and more Jews they live their life among the host community. Now, uh, I think the effect of Bevin uh, was that they destroyed the Jews' illusions that Labour was pro-Israel. They realised they hadn't many friends. Uh, this didn't make them conservative, but it played a part because the argument on Labour is pro. Israel pro-Jewish was blown apart and the truth I think was expressed by Abba Eben asked which party is more supportive of Israel he said the opposition so the Jews simply lost illusions didn't necessarily gain uh, fresh ones you have for several years been very close to the Prime Minister you've written her speeches you've been one of her uh, innermost advisers and she has, uh, it seems, a remarkable rapport with British Jews. She seems to have a remarkable rapport with, with British Jews. I mean, Lord Jakobowicz has been described as her favourite cleric. Uh, she's been the first Prime Minister in many years to, to address the British Board of uh, Deputies. Why do you think there is this particular close relationship between um, what you might call a Goy Prime Minister and Britain's Jews? Well, I've always avoided discussing Jewish or Israeli affairs with the Prime Minister because of my own attachment. I, I know Hebrew and Arabic and uh, written a lot about the Middle East for uh, General Chatham House, etc. But I say this, first of all, she has her constituency has one of the highest uh, proportions of Jews in the country. She comes into contact with them. Secondly, I think, after all, she is an upwardly mobile, low-middle-class person. as much in common. I mean, many with her occupational uh, mobility profile among the Jews, more among the Jews and among the English. And um, she is dealing with Tories, uh, many of whom are representing her heritage wealth and status, and they're rather snobbish. Whereas the Jews are not. The Jews are really, uh, more an American phenomenon, a more democratic get on as best you can phenomenon. So this may mean that if you 
ignored the Jewish side and simply took the personal and occupational economic profile, you find many more similar to her among her Jewish constituents in Finchley than among her English constituents. Are you also saying that there is something in Jewish teaching, its emphasis on the family and its emphasis on, on self-reliance, which fits in more naturally with conservatism than with, with socialism? Well, the whole of the Reformation was a return to what you call the Old Testament and I call the Bible. Uh, it marked them, and when you had this big split in the British, in the Anglican Church, exemplified by Wesley, and which produced the Methodists and nonconformists, the nonconformist tradition altogether again went back to the Bible and the, the nonconformist, hard working, lower middle class, family oriented people, uh, epitomized by Alderman Roberts, they have a great deal in common with uh, the Jew. Uh, of the second generation in Britain, low middle class, family orientation, uh, upward mobility, uh, morality, uh, good works, uh, grace, uh, people earn the goodwill of God. You've, you've been something of a thorn in the flesh of uh, the Jewish establishment in Britain. I remember particularly the fuss there was when you invited Jean-Marie Le Pen to a fringe meeting at a Conservative Party conference and the British Board of Deputies very publicly criticised you. Uh, you obviously feel a little bit uh, at odds with the establishment. Why is that? Uh, well, this wasn't the first time I conflicted with them. Well, the point is the Jewish establishment is unrepresentative until um, the late 30s. The uh, Jewish community was led by the patrician element. People who got on and they led the Jews because they had standing in the wider British community, finance, academy, law, patrician families, many titled. Uh, then you had the revolt. It was actually organised by the Zionists, which took over the... which was anti-assimilation, really, anti-upper-class, anglicised Jews although these were very loyal Jews. They did a lot for Israel financially and replaced them by representatives of the newly enfranchised sort of East European Jews with an underlying antagonism towards the more assimilated, successful uh, upper middle class Jews. And they took over the community and the others left. So the Jewish community to a considerable extent now is run by people who couldn't quite make it in the wider world and they won't last very long because the Jewish community some parts are fully adjusted, accommodated British life and some of course sink away from their Jewishness but these people, I've often said about the Armenians, Greeks and my fellow Jews, we're all individually clever but collectively very often stupid whereas the Turks are individually grave but collectively wise and you have another point, because these organizations are unrepresentative and competitive, they need support money. They tend to compete by shouting the loudest. You had all this noise over Bitburg and or noise over the German. Uh, when it was too late, if they could have got him out of the UN, all right, as it is their campaign. Uh, in, in both cases, you don't fight your friend because he goes to a cemetery where there are a few dead Germans. I remember during the war we used to say the only good Germans were dead ones. So these, by definition, were good Germans. And, but the point is, some years previously, uh, a Russian sort of court Jew was sent over here, Vergelis. He was editor of the Sovietish Daimlander uh, publication in Yiddish. And, uh, the Israelis, who were behind most of these things, organized a boycott of him on the grounds that he was a scoundrel and didn't represent the Jews. And I broke that boycott on the grounds, first of all, if he weren't a scoundrel, I would not accept him as a true representative of Soviet power. But secondly, you have to talk to him, because like Mount Everest, he's there, interchange, get to understand him. And later on, Eban said to me, of course, that I was right. And you have to talk to the establishment. I fought them over that. Le Pen, I said, look, Le Pen is there. 
he uh, can either be become marginalised and very dangerous or mainstream. I think he's right over not wanting Arabs from North Africa. They didn't want the French in Algiers. Why should they come over? And so I pointed out that if there are several million Arab Muslim voters in France, it'll be very bad for Israel. And also I said, look, you're Zionist. You believe in a Jewish uh, national home for the Jews, like all other nations. Now, your whole claim falls to the ground, you say the French don't have a right to their national home, the English have to be swamped and colonised by Muslims and blacks. Either the Israelis right, and after all the Israelis will not let back Arabs who were born there and left in 48 in the war. Either all nations have a right to national home or none do. So, I, I wanted to, I, my tactics were bad, obviously you should win, if you lose you did something wrong. But the idea of a rapprochement with people like the Pen common ground was a good one unfortunately I should have done it in Israel not in Britain and once he made those stupid remarks on the radio it pulled the rug from under his feet and mine but there's no point in letting them do my thing they have been wrong so often and now of course they're at each other's throats over Israel the PLO and the Arabs that they, they nullify themselves because I, I think the mistake is they're too closely involved in I Israeli politics but they are certainly not a powerhouse of intellect and representative character in fact most Jews regard the BBC with a certain amount and uh, the Board of Deputies with a certain amount of good humoured contempt are they, are they decent Jews, good Jews, doing their best but certainly I wouldn't have them think for me Coming back to the argument about, uh, about minorities, Julia Neuberger argues, and I'm paraphrasing her, that as Jews came to Britain as an impoverished ethnic minority, subject to discrimination, then Jews have a, have a duty to be supportive to present-day ethnic minorities, particularly West Indians and Asians. That seems to be a point of view which you do not share. Yes, I think that is a ghetto mentality and false logic. For a start, the Jewish position is totally different from that of West Indians and Asians. The Jews were a diaspora, homeless people, stateless people. They were not citizens of Russia. Therefore, the Jews were refugees who came in. The West Indians, the Indians, they all had demanded and were given a national home of their own. Therefore, they have to make good there. After all, the Jews believe in the right to a national home. And you have about a million people in the Indian subcontinent, a billion people, sorry, and even 1% their annual increase would choke us to death. Therefore, it's sensible for Jews to oppose immigration. Secondly, the English let us in, opened all doors to us, commissioned, judge, professor, lord, you name it. Therefore, I think I owe my loyalty to the English, not to Pakistan, which is an anti-Semitic, backward, anti-Israeli country. Early, obviously, as a Jew, I'm in favour of decent treatment of humans, but again, all the lefties complain, the race relations industry complain that England is a very racist country. Now, if this be true, surely it's a crime to bring these poor devils from uh, West Indies and... Uh, Asia to a country which is racist. They're much better off in their own home. Fourthly, you've got problems of West Indian criminality. It's the poor devils who live in areas with large numbers of Afro-Caribbeans who suffer. The English people, the poor, the elderly, women with young children. I don't think it's a good way of repaying Britain's generosity towards Jews to inflict these horrors on them. Another point is this, the Muslims have never assimilated into a Christian a post-Christian country, their whole way of life, you're creating problems. I think that my duty to the English, uh, who are the majority, who I, whom I live among, who let me in, to look after them. Julia Neuberger is saying a Jew cannot be trusted to be loyal or grateful to England, that their first loyalty is to somebody because he is alien. Now, I say, let's be good to people in spite of their being there, but if you say my main duty is to help totally alien, unassimilable people to come into England at whatever cost to the country and eventually to its political stability. Uh, I think the resentments of the ordinary English against being swamped 
and against so-called uh, multiculturalism, which is a way of destroying the English national character, the thing that Jews fight so strongly for in Israel, could destabilize democracy and lead to horrors of which Jews would then also suffer. Therefore, I think that Julia Neuberger is thinking with her emotions, not with her brains. It's sometimes been said that there is still a real current of anti-Semitism in the top level of British politics. Uh, some Conservative MPs say privately that that was one of the reasons for Leon Britton's downfall, for Edwina Curry's downfall, and it didn't help Nigel Lawson either. Do you think there is something in that? No, you don't need to be an anti-Semite uh, misgivings about Edwina Curry. Uh, there is anti-Semitism at all levels in society, just as there is in the Soviet Union. We were worried about government anti-Semitism. Now we find that popular anti-Semitism is much worse. I don't think, I don't think that anti-Semitism can explain why a minister falls, whether they're Jewish, like Britain, who's only marginally Jewish, and he's never been associated much in Jewish life and married a non-Jewess, and Edwina Curry, who is Church of England, and I think she's the only woman whose entry in Who's Who does not mention her maiden name or that of her parents, which was Cohen, or Nigel Lawson, who's always turned his back on the Jews. It is harder for any, a minister to get there than it is to stay there once they're there, in the law of, uh, what's the opposite of motion, uh, of rest, suggests that once you get there, you usually stay. Now, Leo Breton was dropped from Home Secretary because he wasn't a successful Home Secretary. And he was given a job where I think he would have done well. And he made several serious mistakes, the sort that do get you thrown out as a minister. Therefore, I think it's very unfair to blame it on to anti-Semitism. If you say he had Jewish characteristics, which made him not a very good Home Secretary, that's something else. We have characteristics, we're good at some things, not good at others. He, in the eyes of the Prime Minister, after all, appointed him to the Home Secretaryship, and he's a friend of mine, and I, he was very helpful to me, uh, was not a successful Home Secretary. During the miners' strike, it was she had to press him to get the police working. But he was given a, a very good job in uh, a trading industry, and if it hadn't been for the way he was involved in the Westland affair and deceived the house, he'd still be there. Edwina Curry, well, she has what many people would call Jewish characteristics. I probably share them. She's very pushy, insensitive, a bit too clever for her own good. Although, as I say, she turned her back on Jewry. And she came a cropper because she lacked the knowledge as to when to shut up. So I don't think it was anti Semitism. There's also what you could call secondary anti Semitism which is that when a Jew does something you dislike, then you say, well, they're a Jew. It's different from primary anti-Semitism when you're against Jews. So thirdly, Nigel Lawson, when I've written about him, I think he was disaster as a uh, chancellor. Way back from 85, he started inflating the country to gain short-term popularity. I think he should have been got rid of a lot earlier. And I don't think that his residual Jewishness was a factor. After all, he resigned... He wasn't thrown out. If he'd hung on, he could have hung on. But the fact is that he bears a good deal of responsibility, not all responsibility by any means, for the economy's bad condition. Malcolm Rifkind wrote in the Jewish Chronicle years ago, before he became a member of the government, that if there were many more Jewish MPs in the work at that time, there could be real problems, suggesting that the Jews were so overrepresented in Parliament it was becoming something of an embarrassment and there could be a backlash. That does disclose a certain sensitivity, doesn't it, about Jewishness among Jewish politicians? Well, one's sensitive about him. After all, Malcolm Rifkind's typical German. He's managed to get into the cabinet and he will probably stay there and he's probably likely to get one further promotion. 
But the typical Jewish attitude is, is the other Jews, of course, are anti-Semitism. I mean, if only <laughs> there were less Jews around providing I'm here, it's a, it's a good thing. Well, you can't really argue against that, yes or no. Uh, very hard to say, because people get used to, let's say, there were three or four Jews in post-war conservative parliamentary party, and people might have said, well, three or four is all right, but if you went up to eight or nine, now there are how many? Sixteen, I think. Sixteen, and people say, well, if there were many more, people get used to that. Uh, so the, one time the Labour Party didn't mind large numbers of MPs, now all the all graduates from the Polytechnic who are trying to get in left-wingers, they become first anti-Israeli and then anti-Semitic. Uh, who, who knows what's going to happen next? But, by and large, obviously, you'd have to ask Rifkin whether he agrees now with what he said then. You talk about anti-Semitism on the left now. Are you convinced that there is no distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Because, of course, people on the left would say they are anti-Zionist, but definitely not anti-Semitic. Uh, there is a distinction, but very, very often they go together. And certainly in, in the communist and Arab world, they use Zionist as a synonym for Jew. And many of the much of the anti-Zionism of the left is simply disguised anti-Semitism to get the Jew out of that job and to take his place. Just, if I can ask perhaps one final question, uh, as an overview, we have, uh, as I say, over the past half century seen a marked swing in the political affiliations of British Jews from the left and the far left to the centre right and the right. Now, are we going to see a swing back? As you say, this is a cyclical process. Are we going to see British Jewry moving back towards the left or towards the centre? Well, uh, the centre is falling to pieces in this country. A few years ago, it looked as if it had a bright future, and now it doesn't. So people aren't going to move to something which barely exists. Uh, you've had this irrevocable change in the Jewish community. They're much less foreign than they were. They're much more rooted here. Their numbers are declining, by the way, and we're down to 300,000 or so, even if you stretch the definition to its broadest. By the middle of the next century, there won't be more than 100,000 uh, committed in any way Jews, but their class, they're still rising socially, so the Jewish proletariat hardly exists, and even the better off clerical workers and self-employed, their children are not. So that process, the social mobility and rootedness are going to continue for some time ahead, therefore one assumes that their reflection will be Jews, well more and more Jews lived in areas which voted Labour. They now nearly all live in areas which vote Tory. Uh, this way, or they move from Hackney North and Tottenham and uh, Haringey, which well, Haringey is still Tory, to areas which are conservative voting, and they adopt the natural colouring and voting habits of the areas they move to. I think this will continue. Uh, the rest depends how, how the people in the next century relate to the problems of the human condition. Uh, there may be totally new movements, new views, and if there are new currents, I think the Jews will be very prominent in whatever new current there is. But uh, I can't legislate for posterity. In the East End, in the, in the mid to late 30s, when you joined the Communist Party, uh, and when so many other Jews did, uh, was it cause and effect Jew became communist, or was it because of some... Well, let me, let me put it over to you and make the point you want to make. Well, the Jew, in a sense, Jew contains two concepts, of being a Jew and ceasing to be a Jew. Throughout history, large numbers of Jews have ceased to be Jews. And the Jews who joined the Communist Party were, for the most part, people who did not feel anything positive. Jewishness meant foreignness, it meant speaking bad English, it meant being an alien. And therefore you tried to get away from that, and some of us simultaneously got away from it by studying classics, by uh, acquiring some English culture, acculturation, 
and also by joining the Communist Party, by being a communist, you felt you ceased to be a Jew, you were a member of a, a worldwide movement in which you were no longer a Jew, you were a person, a communist. It was only later you realised that you simply joined another Jewish faction. But uh, Mick Mindel, who was very active in the Jewish tailoring trade unions in the late 30s and 40s, who was himself an active member of the Communist Party, describes his membership as part of that process of, of being active in the Jew Jewish labour movement, a very specifically Jewish labour movement. And as you say, the, the Communist Party in East End was so overwhelmingly Jewish, how could one possibly join it to escape one's Jewish identity? You, you, you ignore they weren't Jews, you see, you joined and you had this picture of being members of a great human movement and the members you saw around you just happened to be Jews but others happened to be Scotsmen or Welsh. It was partly self-deception. The tailors were a very special category. It was To be a tailor was almost to be a Jew. To be a Jew was almost to be a tailor. The word Sherman, of course, means tailor in German. But by and large, there was a good element of self-deception, as there is in most things. You opted out of being a Jew, which you were very sensitive about, and became a member of the world proletariat. And this illusion lasted a certain time uh, until it wore off. But did rival parties at that time, in particular the Labour Party, uh, use the ex almost exclusive Jewish composition of the Communist Party against the Communist Party? And was the talk about uh, the Communist Party being a Jew party? I never heard it said. I no doubt that people noticed it and underneath. But of course, the Labour Party uh, Jew had a disproportionately large Jewish membership and large numbers of Jewish MPs. There was probably a competition for Jews at that time because the Labour Party did not have uh, many educated people. They had a small number of, of upper-middle-class people, the crossmen of this world, but they were short of working intellectuals, the solicitors and the accountants and school teachers who made up an important part of the Labour Party in Parliament and in local authorities. The Jews were very handy then, uh, whereas the expansion of what's uh, euphemistically called higher education nowadays, producing very large numbers of our undereducated uh, young people, has given, uh, made them unnecessary to, to depend on Jews. What I've read by in, in the way of memoirs of people who were communists in the East End, particularly Joe Jacobs, who wrote his own autobiography about his membership of the Communist Party in Stepney, he gives the impression that Jews joined the Communist Party out of insular defensiveness. The, the fascists were on the attack, there were attacks on Jewish property, on times against Jewish people in the streets, and Jews joined the Communist Party as a form of Jewish defence league, very much because they were Jews. I think this is propaganda, self-deception. The fascist danger was very much deliberately overrated by the communists, and wherever possible, the communists provoked the fascists in order that they should have something to defend against. It was grist to their mill. If it hadn't been for the communists who uh, were deliberately provoking it to have something to be against, the, one would have heard very much less of fascism. Why was it then, it was probably before your time, but Harry Pollitt stood as a communist candidate in the East End. Why didn't they put up a Jewish candidate? After all, when they eventually put up Piratin in '45, long after the heyday of Jewish communism, he actually won. I don't know. You'd have to go to the documents and the people concerned to know the reason. Did you ever campaign in Yiddish in the East End? I, 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 I never spoke Yiddish. I never knew Yiddish. So all party meetings were in English? I don't know, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, in Hackney, they were in English. Uh, if you go into the history of it, before the First World War, uh, the Jewish trade unions and labour meetings might have been held in Yiddish, but by my time, the Jews born in this country very rarely spoke fluent Yiddish. Some spoke Russian or Polish, some uh, nothing but Judeo-English, as it were. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, you wouldn't have got very far with Yiddish. It died even in uh, the Russian Empire. It was being replaced by Russian and later Polish. But you, this was in, in the heart of the East End. I just don't know. But by and large, Yiddish would have been used by the Bund more 
uh, were trying to revive in this country the large Jewish uh, organizations which they had in the Russian Empire, which had five million Jews, whereas in Britain at the time there were a couple of hundred thousand in various levels of assimilation. The importance of Yiddish is generally overestimated. Obviously, the, the Jewish identity is very important to you, as it is to most people who, who regard themselves as Jewish. But how do you strike the balance? Are you Jewish first or English first? Uh, this is a very difficult question t to answer. Uh, fact is, first of all, the Jews in general in this country are very heterogeneous. And some of them brought up here think themselves as English. They think of their, themselves as Jews by religion. Uh, because of my background in history, I think of myself as a Jew because of my history. I remember saying, getting misquoted, of course, the quote is almost invariably to misquote, that I've been a Jew for about 4,000 years and an Englishman for one generation. So sometimes you feel very English, particularly when you're abroad, uh, but some Jews of my background will say they're English. Others of us are honest or aware enough to recognize that our psychology is not English, or Sherman or a Bernard Levin is different from English. That is a two-sided, two-edged uh, characteristic, and you have to make the best of it. We, we are different. The very large numbers of Jewish entrepreneurs in this country, Eastern Europe, shows the Jew has a propensity to go in, not some, simply make money, but new industries, new ideas. Jews, by nature, tend to be active, we are endowed with divine discontent, which made many turn to socialism at one time, but there is a feeling of solidarity with Jews in all times and places. You are a Jew, and there's a good deal of Jewishness in you. And you but the important thing is to come to terms with it, whether you do so by becoming a Zionist, and living in Israel, or being active in Jewish organizations. The, the important thing is to recognize that it's there and it's a positive thing. And if you have to pay the price of a bit of anti-Semitism, well, it's not a very high price to pay for being one of God's chosen people. There, there is the issue of divided loyalties. I, I went to a school in Leeds which had uh, a large number of Jewish pupils. And uh, the great bone of contention, it was always a rather dubious way of raising it, but we used to tease the Jew, Jewish children about if there was war between Britain and Israel who would you support? And they would obviously always say, oh, of course we'd support Israel and we would say, well you're not proper Englishmen, are you? And there is that question of split loyalties which is uh, misunderstood and causes a certain amount of resentment, don't you feel? Well, I'm in favour of split loyalties uh, for everybody. I think a man who has one only exclusive loyalty is a monomaniac and dangerous. This is what was wrong with Germany. I think people should feel they're English. Um, a Scot has divided loyalties between being a Scot and British. He's a member of the human race. He's a doctor. I, I, I think people who can only have one loyalty are not very good at loyalty, or they're dangerous. And, uh, there are times when being a Jew and an Englishman can cause conflicts. There are times when being anything, anything cause conflicts. A Catholic in this country is sometimes subjected to conflict, but I don't think it would be worthwhile giving up his religion and his place in the next world for that. I, I think that having mixed origins and conflicts does a Jew good. It partly explains our breadth of vision, newness, uh, and success. When you say it's worth enduring a little bit of anti-Semitism to be one of God's chosen people, is that an entirely serious remark? It, not entirely serious, but serious enough. I think it's part of our destiny. Remember the saying that Jews are just like everyone else, only more so. Uh, 